And now I invite you to settle back and relax. Come into this space and let go of all your concerns, all the trials and tribulations of your day, and just take a nice breath. And give yourself permission to just be here. Breathe in the air of the quiet night, here and now. I share with you a favorite poem by the 12th century Sufi poet Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are crowds of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of all of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing out you, may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from the beyond. Our chalice lighting is an adaptation from Changing Seasons by Stephen Schick. Rumi said, this being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival. This guest house metaphor rests uncomfortably on the modern mind. We like to think we are more like private mobile homes. We can open and close the doors at will, all the time moving in the direction we choose. We are not flop houses taking in whoever comes. We are in control of our destiny. And yet we soon become disillusioned resentful and self-pitying when we believe that we are in charge of nearly everything that happens to us. Living day in and day out with this expectation is not good training for the times when life suddenly turns south. Death, illness, and physical and psychological suffering comes as thieves in the night robbing us of this illusion that we can keep emotions out once they have invited themselves in. At the end of a day filled with the good things of life, we go to bed satisfied and content, and yet we wake up anxious and fearful the next morning. A pestering health concern arrives unannounced, and even those of us who generally dismiss such things find ourselves motionless and imagining the worst, wondering what will happen to the family if we die, not someday, but today. How quickly we can become locked inside our temporarily <clears throat> immobile homes with the visiting fear of our own mortality and the mortality of those we love. Whether it is the pain of fear, or grief, or rejection, or anger, or deep disappointment, we can analyze our uninvited guests psychologically, study their sociological characteristics, and, and examine them chemically or biologically. Through all that, we can gain insight, but we are still left with the simple fact that these guests are always arriving, always traveling with us. Rumi implores us to welcome and entertain them all. I light this chalice this evening for the shared warmth and understanding of being together. I light this chalice with the hope that even in the darkest of times, the light begins to return. And it is with acceptance. I like this chalice for all that life brings. 
both from the shadow and from the light. The Journey by David White Above the mountains, the geese turn into the light again, painting their black silhouettes on an open sky. Sometimes everything has to be inscribed across the heavens so you can find the one line already written inside you. Sometimes it takes a great sky to find that small, bright, and an indescribable wedge of freedom in your heart. Sometimes with the bones of the black stick left when the fire has gone out, someone has written something new in the ashes of your life. You are not leaving, you are arriving. In Blackwater Woods by Mary Oliver, look, the trees are turning their own bodies into pillars of light are giving off the rich fragrance of cinnamon and fulfillment. The long tapers of cattails are bursting and floating away over the blue shoulders of the ponds. And every pond, no matter what its name is, is nameless now. Every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this. The fires and the black river of loss whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. For me, Christmas has been an odd mixture of dread and fun for most of my life. As a kid, it was something to look forward to, but it never did live up to all the hype, you know? Our parents couldn't afford what I really wanted, and they didn't really want to shower us with endless presents of the latest toys anyhow, even if we wanted them. And I am grateful now, but back then, as young as I was, I knew this wasn't what our consumer society expected of Christmas. We had simple fun at Christmas time instead. Sledding and tubing on the day we went to the forest to find a tree, decorating it with our very old lights and enjoying special holiday food and drink. Yet the best part for me was leaving everyone else and going across the street to a pond all by myself and skating all afternoon. Those moments of solitude, skating in the quiet of nature, are still some of the most poignant memories of my entire life. They are not full of joy, but they are full of birdsong and the bright sun and the hard work of shoveling snow to make a path because it wasn't already prepared. We lived in the country. These were the times of loneliness, longing, and honesty, as well as joy as I flew through the air and taught myself how to spin. Even though I had great heartache as a child, I still treasure those moments with my family, as dysfunctional as they might have been. And I had no idea those moments would end as quickly as they did. In my mid-twenties, about a month before Christmas, I had heard words that changed my life. Dana, your dad, who was 50 years old at the time, has cancer. He has maybe three days, three weeks, possibly three months to live. How could this be? I can't survive without my dad. My world was ending. 
the holiday that year, the holidays that year were just a blur of numbness and shock and pain as we all tried to grasp this horrible news. How do we have a last Christmas? And how do we say goodbye forever? I never really knew grief until then. And I still carry some of it with me every holiday season. And honestly, it comforts me. And the truth is, I carry it with me every day, holiday or not. It is one of the ways that my father is still with me. It is a complex mixture of thoughts and emotions now, part of the quiet, still moments of loneliness and melancholy when I sit in the mystery of the cycle of life. My most treasured holiday times are not full of happiness and good cheer. They're full of honest reflection about life and death for one is the companion of the other. And isn't that really what this time of year is about? Our world has become quiet and dormant. It is resting in its own solitude. Life slips quietly into deep peace. And in the quietest moment, when it may seem all is lost, the faintest glimmer of renewal begins, hidden deep beneath the cold, protected from the wind, the spark of new growth. It is true within us too. Sadness and grief have the capacity to burn us bare and take us down to that place seemingly utter destruction. Yet deep within are the first flickers of a new beginning. It is, as David White says, the bones of the black sticks that are left when the fire has gone out Someone has written something new in the ashes of, their, of your life. You are not leaving. You are arriving. In Mary Oliver's poem, Blackwater Woods, she says that every year, everything I have ever learned in my lifetime leads back to this the fire and the black river of loss, whose other side is salvation, whose meaning none of us will ever know. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, and to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends on it. And when the time comes, to let it go, to let it go. Letting go is the hardest thing. It is the work of our deepest grief. Yet in the letting go, we discover the beginning of our salvation and our own renewal. Whatever this time of year brings up for you, even if it brings unwanted guests, may you experience it to its fullest. To be fully alive and truly awake means to embrace all of life's offerings, whatever they may be. May these dark times be fertile ground for all of us. And I invite you to join with me in a litany and just respond with, we remember, we forgive, and we love. This is our meditation this evening. So I invite you into a space of meditation, thinking about the things that you remember. 
that you forgive, and that you love. For gifts we yearn for, but did not receive. We, are we remember, we forgive, forgive and, and we love. love. For things we received but never wanted, we remember, we forgive, we forgive and, and we love. love. For those who offered us comfort, offered us cheer, when what we needed was comfort. We remember, we forgive, and we love. For those who gave us gifts, but never their presence, we remember, we forgive, and we love. For those who offered us love, but could not, but we could not accept it, we remember, we forgive, and we love. For ourselves, who could not give what was needed, we remember, we forgive, and we love. For those we have loved deeply, who left us too soon, we remember, we forgive, and we love. For holidays that didn't live up to our hopes, we remember, we forgive, and we love. For ghosts of Christmas past that haunt us to this day, we remember, we forgive, and we love. For those who, like the innkeeper, turned us away, and for those we rejected, Fearing we had no room in our homes or our hearts. We remember, we forgive, and we love. For the times we saw a star in the east, but failed to follow it. And for the times we followed it faithfully, but it did not lead where we had hoped. We remember, forgive, and we love. For wise men and women whose gifts were rejected. And for those whom we thought were wise and trusted to our detriment. We remember, we forgive, and we love. For miracles gone unnoticed until it was too late. We remember. We forgive and we love. For salvation that still has yet to arrive. We remember, we forgive, and we love. For all these things, we pray that we may be granted an abiding serenity in all of our memories and that we may find peace now and in the days to come. May it be so. Amen. And I'm going to light a few more candles. Not just because I'm a pyromaniac. <laughs> <laughs> but for all, all of the people that of suffering and all the unspoken heavy burdens that we each carry with us, whatever they may be. So I invite you to just rest in silence for a few moments. During the moments of grief, remembering that for our true selves, our masks come off and our honesty comes out. And this is the moment we can find ourselves again, our souls. So I share with you a poem called Love After Love by Derek Walcott. 
as we return to who we truly are. The time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at each other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you have ignored for another who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit. Feast on your life for all that it is. Take courage, my friends. The way is often hard, and the path is never clear. And the stakes are oh so very high, for it is our lives. Take courage, for deep down there is yet another truth. You are not alone. I invite you all to please stand. Hold hands with the folks next to you. If you might feel alone, feel that hand that you are holding. And remember, that hand and the person connected to it <laughs> also knows grief and also knows how to laugh. We are deep and complex. Let us give permission for Christmas to be deep and complex, too. May the green arise within you, and may you be renewed. Amen. Thank you.